Bonjour. Hello. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome to all of you, wherever you are in the world, to the third edition of the Paris Peace Forum, which is focusing today on uh, our collective response to the coronavirus crisis, both in terms of improving our response, but also working together towards a more sustainable world. My name is Anne Le Mort. I'm the co-founder of an international initiative called Chef for the Planet, which is uh, an international network of chefs and engaged partners to promote sustainable and healthy diets, eating and, and gastronomy and food systems. Prior to coming back to Paris, which is my home in France, I worked for 20 years uh, across the world including uh, mainly with the United Nations. And in my last position, I was the chief of staff at the UN Environment Programme based in Nairobi in, in Kenya. And so I'm particularly delighted to be here today with you all and with our four distinguished speakers to speak about such an important environment issue as the issue of the linkages between biodiversity loss and the erosion of erosion of our ecosystems and the rise of pandemics and the spread of virus. I think scientific, scientists uh, tell us and have been telling us for many years with no uncertainty that we are in a state of planetary emergency with interdependent crises of biodiversity loss, ecosystem degradation and climate change. And these crises are driven in great part by human activity and unsustainable production and consumption practices, unsustainable agriculture, unsustainable food systems. And these environment crises and pandemics um, in turn cause harm to our life support and aggravate poverty and inequalities. And I think wherever we are in the world today, what we've been witnessing with the COVID-19 crisis really show us uh, that this is really happening now. This is not the future, this is happening in front of us. And so as the awareness is rising, uh, new responses are also emerging. New responses centered around nature conservation, nature-based innovative solutions and investments, regenerative practices to meet those challenges and transform in a systematic way uh, the way uh, we do our, our action and our business. And this is very encouraging. Obviously, we need to do more, we need to do more faster, but this is great news. And to help us understand the challenges and also the solutions that are emerging, as mentioned, I'm really thrilled to have four amazing speakers with us. Uh, we're going to have about uh, 40, 45 minutes together. And with no further ado, I would now like to, to pass on the floor to our first speakers, the French Secretary of State for Biodiversity, Miss Bérangère Abba. Bonjour, Minister. It's a really a, a delight to, to have you here with us. Um, in view of the latest report, um, scientific reports, clearly establishing the linkages between uh, biodiversity loss and the rise of new diseases and, and pandemics, could you perhaps tell us a bit more about the way you perceive these connections? What are the main triggers? What are the main connections? And most importantly, what can governments do, governments and countries like France and its European partners, what can you do, we do, to address those challenges? Minister, the floor is yours. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour à tous. Thank you and uh, hello to all of you. We do have all of the information today that we need uh, and the scientists had warned us the health crisis shows the significant 
impact of uh, um, the disruption of uh, ecological balance in nature and harm done to biodiversity. We've never had such a clear signal, clear sign. And we have truly a mandate uh, uh, to preserve um, biodiversity. The um, international panel report that came out recently shows very clearly that all human pressure that can have an impact on nature can disrupt these balances and can give rise uh, to these pandemics. So we have these uh, microbes that come from animal species, and we must uh, work uh, to fight against all the pressures uh, on biodiversity. And of course, global warming is also involved. Uh, we must act as a matter of urgency, and we must work on the land use, uh, on how to transform agriculture, how to deal with trade on the trade and the consumption of uh, animal species, including wild species, and of course, uh, the uh, trafficking of species. Uh, all of these things have to be done in order to avoid the transmission from animals to humans. And all of this uh, with a goal to achieving resilience so that we're really working on the prevention side rather than the cure side. Today, what we're seeing is the economic impact uh, with uh, the current health crisis. And the cost of prevention would be, or is estimated, to be 100 times less than the economic cost that we are suffering from today. And of course, not to mention uh, the human tragedies with a number of deaths and the people who are um, uh, made ill with a disease. So with this unprecedented uh, event, uh, we're seeing a very strong awareness, so, uh, both among political uh, decision makers but amongst the population large. And 2020 has been a year to search for solutions. And everybody is united looking for actions and solutions and to see how to address the issue of the interaction between uh, uh, species and humans. And, and basically, we're motivated by this vision of One Health, something that will be presented tomorrow with a very strong commitments being made at national and international level that should help us to uh, decompartmentalize our policies and to take a more holistic view. And uh, my colleague, uh, the minister, Mr. Uh, Le Drian, will be presenting this when he talks about how international organizations work together in a way that's more um, holistic, both locally, nationally, internationally, across uh, issues and sectors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would like now to turn to another part of, of the world, uh, namely Asia, uh, if uh, Mr. Liu is, is with us. Um, you are one of the key Chinese negotiators for uh, the next, from China, for the next convention on bio logical diversity, the COP15, which is due to take place next year in Kunming in, in China. How does the current COVID-19 pandemic influence the global biodiversity agenda? And according to you, um, what measures could countries take to tackle this challenge? I'm just wondering if, if Mr. Liu is with us, because we cannot see him on the screen. It seems he might not be with us. So in, in that case, um, with apologies, I, I will go to our third speaker, um, also to look at other regions in the world and, uh, and the multilateral level. Um, Ms. Razan Al-Mubarak, uh, welcome. You are the managing director of the Mohammed bin Said Species Conservation Fund based in uh, the United Arab Emirates. And you are also a candidate for the next presidency of the International Union of Conservation of Nature. 
You have written a lot on the linkages between uh, biodiversity loss and the rise of pandemics. And you have also advocated for an international recovery plan. Could you perhaps tell us a bit more about uh, what such a plan uh, would entail? And how does it fit with the Leaders' Pledge for Nature that was adopted by more than 60 countries and many other engaged actors, such as businesses, civil societies, cities, local governments, um, in September at the United Nations Biodiversity Summit? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, just to really add on um, a Minister uh, Abba's uh, remarks with respect to the consequences of the pandemic, we obviously know that they've been severe economically, socially, uh, politically, but also it has significant effects on the environment. On one hand, it's been positive. We've seen um, real reduction in greenhouse gas emissions across across the world, really. Um, you know, in, in comparison, um, 2020 will see an 8% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions compared to 2019. And this uh, percent percentage drop is extremely significant, as, as you probably all agree with me. We haven't seen such a percentage drop since the Second World War. But on the other hand, how has nature rebounded? And in fact, the question is, has it rebounded? And unfortunately, not. And this, um, I would say, dichotomy of uh, separating the issues of climate change and the issues of nature conservation, whilst, of course, they're very related, but they're very separate, because we all know that the drivers of climate change um, are, are very different from the drivers of ecological loss and, and nature degradation. So nature, in fact, has not rebounded. It's actually taken a very big hit. Um, 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 quite significantly for, for many reasons. First, um, the lockdown had also locked down essential workers. Those workers who are working in the field of conservation are not in the field um, uh, anymore. Um, and as such, the, the, uh, the, uh, the attacks or, or the infringement on, on, on nature around the world, unfortunately, in some places, is going uh, unabated. Um, and also the econ economic uh, recession has also meant that there is less financial support to those organizations that are doing vital conservation world across across the world. And, um, and, 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 and it also actually, um, this lack of funding to an already underfunded sector is really uh, putting the sector they're an existential threat. Um, civil societies around the world are finding it very difficult to continue to operate. And with that, um, you know, not having our frontline workers, not having our civil societies able to address conservation challenges is a very big risk moving, moving forward. And finally, as we all know, migration has had a big, uh, big effect on, on, on nature. Um, around the world, as people lose their jobs in cities, they're moving into rural areas, putting additional um, um, pressures on, on nature. So what is happening? Um, governments around the world are taking and making big gestures in injecting money back into the economy. And there has been very good announcements on green deals. Um, what I've been advocating with a number of other uh, um, uh, governments around the world is that these green deals actually have a nature recovery plan. So you don't just look at halting emissions, but you look at protecting nature where biodiversity is given the necessary stimulus um, to, to survive and indeed thrive, from supporting local NGOs to financing uh, infrastructure, natural infrastructure. This does create jobs, as we saw it happening in, in New Zealand, when New Zealand announced a $1.1 billion program aiming to create 11,000 jobs through major investments in restoring wetlands, riverbanks, and removing invasive species. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is that it's very important when we look and we talk about stimulus programs and stimulus projects around the world, that we do not um, relegate 
nature conservation as something out of these, uh, not included in these recovery programs. We need to ensure that these green deals also have a nature recovery plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, very clear. And uh, and I think uh, we would uh, really all agree with, uh, with what you're, you've been saying. Uh, you, you've, you've mentioned civil society. Um, so, and, and the fact that uh, there were some issues with, with funding. Uh, perhaps uh, Isabella, um, Isabella Portesi, you are the conservative director at uh, the World Wildlife Fund in, in Italy. Um, what do you think about um, this, the, need, uh, uh, the need for these nature recovery plans and, and also this uh, leader's pledge for, for nature? Is it the way, the way to go? And um, what are the main elements uh, you think we should focus on going forward? We cannot hear you well. No, we cannot hear you, Isabella. Let's wait and, and see if this is um, meanwhile, just to mention that unfortunately due to another technical uh, problems, our Chinese uh, colleague um, will not be able to join us. So we are an an unbalanced gender panel uh, with uh, with women, um, and hopefully uh, Isabella Pertesi, uh, we can now hear you. Isabella, the floor is yours. We cannot. Uh, I think we we're hearing you. Can you hear me now? But yes. Okay. Wonderful. Excellent. Isabella, I don't know what the happened. Civil society I... view. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. So let, let's go back to this um, pledge for nature, which I'm very fond about because just a few weeks ago, during the United Nations um, Assembly in New York, there was a, there has been a biodiversity summit, and during this summit, 75 head of states and head of government have. Uh, committed to, to the nature uh, uh, pledge, which is actually the full name is uh, nature pledge for to reverse biodiversity loss by 2030. And I think this is an outstanding uh, and incredible step forward because this pledge was endorsed by 75 plus uh, the European Union. And I think that all together Together, these countries count for one third of a GDP and 1.6 billion people all around the world. So it is a very important uh, document. Of course, of course, now we need to translate that into action. But in the pledge, there is everything we need. And the thing that I most like about it is this paragraph that I'm going to read it to you because so you because it speaks for itself and the paragraph says or the head of states and the head of country uh, the governments in endorsing this pledge for nature we commit ourselves not simply to words but to meaningful action and mutual accountability to address the planetary and emergency. It marks a turning point and comes with an explicit recognition that we will be judged and now and by future generations on our willingness and ability to meet its aims. I think this is extremely important because it's about accountability. I think the key ingredient for a successful uh, new decade that really puts uh, nature at the center of our economy, at the center of our recovery plans,
at the center of our societies. We need really that leaders become uh, accountable and they, we should hold them accountable for what they're willing to do and what they are not willing to do. I think this is extremely important because we can also, we all of us can contribute to really reverse the loss of nature, the declining of biodiversity. But head of states and business leaders and leaders from all over the world, they are in a special position to do something which is more relevant and to lead humanity out of this crisis. Because it's not only a health crisis, it's not a climate crisis, it's not only a Nature crisis is an ecological crisis, and in order to solve it, we should work together, and we must follow leaders. And this is why this pledge, which was endorsed by 75 leaders, is so important for the next decade. And the pledge talks about everything which is meaningful to to reverse nature loss. It talks about restoration. It talks about uh, commitment to a very strong and sound uh, biodiversity strategy framework. It talks about everything we need to do to save the planet. It, it, we know what we need to do. It is now the time to act. And hopefully leaders will, these leaders will meet again in one year time in New York and they will peer review their actions, what they were to do what they were able to drive and the success that they achieved. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you so much. Um, perhaps following on on what you've just mentioned about this is, we, we know what to do. This is now the time to act. Uh, we have many concrete plans. Uh, we have ideas. We have solutions. Finance is also coming. And, and uh, we, we, we may talk about uh, finance so afterwards, but in terms of accountability of, of leaders, clearly, even if, if, if we know what to do, it's, there is specific responsibility on head of states, you mentioned governments, countries, but everyone together, you mentioned together, everyone needs to do something about it. So, um, Minister Abba, maybe what do you think in terms of, you know, having and this ambitious transformational post-2020 global biodiversity framework, uh, which is a framework which will be discussed at the, no the next COP biodiversity in China next year, the one I referred to earlier on. What can all the different actors do? Um, not only uh, countries and governments we've discussed, but also international organizations, the private sector, local governments, and uh, civil society and citizens as well. Oh, to really the Can you hear me? Very well. I would agree entirely. We've got our diagnosis. It's shared broadly, I believe. So the responsibility is crystal clear for states they are managing the crisis with recovery plans in a state of emergency. But they shouldn't cast into shade what lies ahead, because the world of tomorrow is now that we have to deal with it. And future generations will be looking at the decisions we're taking now. And we need to know what we're doing, because we do know what we need to do. So this coalition of leaders for uh, the natural world has taken up all the challenges and has drafted the roadmap with the building of these considerations into the role into the recovery plan with the uh, resources which are unprecedented that you have detailed so this needs to be directed very much in the direction of this transition energy environmental but in addition to that we also need to be uh, insured of the fact uh, that this under the cup 15 comes under a holistic vision across all activities of sect uh, sectorial activities of different levels of intervention and taking into consideration of management by our fellow citizens, by our consumers, by our manufacturers and producers that also need to build in those considerations. And this 
I mean, it's, it's, sometimes they don't have the tools, the requisite tools. So as public authorities today, we need to uh, give them the tools to enable everybody corporations, consumers, citizens, to grasp uh, this transition, uh, which obviously is uh, holds no doubt for anybody that it exists. We need to uh, show, uh, we need to understand the, the right of the environment and operate in, a, in an equitable uh, fashion. And all this work, I mean, I can see this as uh, a new Secretary of State with the biodiversity portfolio, and President Macron and the head of the government uh, made a significant gesture uh, in terms of biodiversity with a view of establishing a, a ministerial portfolio d addressing these matters uh, across all levels. Uh, we've said we need to step up in the mark. And if we want to bring this uh, into the international arena, it also needs to be addressed domestically and, of course, within the EU community. It's a, it's a, it's a, major, a major issue at that level. We have work among ministries, which is rather tricky at domestic levels and at local level. So this is something that we need to grapple with to have legitimacy and consistency and become coherent with what we're addressing beyond France's borders. So it's a roadmap which is very uh, substantial, very ambitious, but within this international framework, particularly under the aegis of the COP15 with, with uh, protecting species, protecting the natural world, that we all need to uh, uh, adopt nationally, and this is what we'll be doing between now and 2021 in terms of the national strategy for biodiversity for the next uh, 10 years, and it's my hope that we'll be able to uh, provide outcomes in respect of that before uh, 20, uh, before the COP, COP15. And I think what has worked for the Paris Accords, for example, was this mobilization. We really need to uh, get on board with us this uh, momentum, this impetus, impetus, and unfortunately, this crisis that we're being battered with uh, is, is an opportunity, is a silver lining, if you will. So, so we have very tangible points. We talked about work or health in the workplace. We also need to address deforestation, all the strategies that can be set in motion f with regard to ecological transition, but also in terms of our manufacturing and consumption modes, which have an impact on biodiversity through deforestation. And this needs to be uh, if set into a holistic context. Monetary flows, financial flows, the financial dimension, which very much needs to sit alongside what we'll be setting in motion. And I subscribe to the task force's work on financial disclosure, because here, this is an instrument that can be used to prompt financial flows being directed to uh, actionable governmental uh, policies. This will be uh, addressed through the ICN Nature Congress that has been pushed back to 221, but we'll be hosting in Marseille, in all likelihood, uh, uh, in, at some point in, in 2021. And the head of heads of state with One Planet Summit, summit that will be occurring in January, uh, we, they need to address, we need to address all these matters in order to make our, our actions tangible at uh, international level, but also at the highest possible uh, domestic level. We need to find consistency between what we're doing within the EU community and within our own borders and what we're defending internationally. And our uh, Chinese friend and colleague, I think, has joined us, so I, I, I give him the floor. Um, thank you so much, and uh, we are really delighted uh, to, to see that uh, Mr. Liu uh, was able to join us. I hope he can hear us as well. Um, if you don't mind, before uh, giving you the floor, Mr. Mr. Liu, and just to remind um, everyone that uh, you are um, one of the negotiators from from China uh, on the convention of uh, for the convention on biodiversity, uh, biological diversity, the COP15, which will take place in China um, next uh, next year. If you do not mind, I just wanted to um, jump on on what Minister Abba has just told us and and go uh, before arriving in China. I go back to the Middle East um, with uh, 
uh, Razan Al Mubarak and just ask Razan in, in very short, uh, a few, uh, very quickly, whether you could tell us. We, we've heard mention about uh, the role of countries and governments. Could you perhaps tell us a little bit more about uh, the role of businesses and finance? We know there are very important investments. We know that there is a lot, there's been a lot of progress in terms of investment uh, towards conservation of, of, of nature. Um, could you tell us your views and what could we do to en entice banks and investors to do a little bit more? And then uh, I will go back to uh, Mr. Liu for perhaps uh, the closing remarks uh, since uh, we are almost at the end of our panel. Um, Razan, the floor is yours. Um, ab absolutely, absolutely. But first, I just wanted to briefly uh, comment on uh, Minister Abba's remark. We absolutely do know what we need to do to reverse the biodiversity loss or the trends in biodiversity loss. But as she said, time is the essence. And that time is particularly critical and important for those NGOs that are currently on the ground, that are currently in a very bad situation from a financial perspective due to the economic recession. So we need to ensure that that vibrant sector does not go away. We need to continue, we need to move, and we need to support this vibrant sector in ways that we didn't do in the past, perhaps. Perhaps in the past, our focus was financing projects. I think it's very critical now that we move towards financing the ex existence of these civil societies that are really on the front line working on nature conservation. So, and I also wanted to say, I just love your title, Minister Abba. The fact that you have a state secretary for biodiversity is, I think, a great testament for um, your, your country's um, uh, prioritizing this very important issue. And I hope that many other governments follow suit. But let's talk about business. We all know that there has been a progressive shift in the business community to pursue environmental concerns over the last two decades. It first perhaps took the form of corporate social responsibility. Um, perhaps that was seen mainly as an ornamental add-on and not a fundamental change to business practices. This has now evolved into um, the ESG framework or the Environment Society Governance Framework, which provided a much stronger proposition um, for the environment to be an integral uh, part of our of, of the investment theses of, of companies and corporations around the world. And there were many takers and are many takers. We see that in small, medium, and large in, uh, large businesses. According to the McKinsey report there's been a tenfold increase in global sustainability investment over the last uh, few, few years, which is incredible. And many blue tech scientists, uh, uh, many blue tech giants around the world, as you know, Amazon, Microsoft, um, have joined many corporations in announcing big climate change plans. But, but here's the thing. E in the ESG framework is very largely defined and limited to a climate change narrative and not an overall nature narrative that includes the protection of nature, that includes the protection of habitats and the restoration of ecosystems. So as such, what, uh, what, what you know, many of us are pushing for is an expansion of the narrative of the E. The framework is there. You have corporations taking this up, but we need to expand the narrative to include nature protection and biodiversity protection. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now I would like to turn to um, Mr. Ning Liu. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, we're really delighted that you were able to connect. Um, you're, as I mentioned, a negotiator uh, for the next COP, which will uh, be in China, uh, the COP uh, on biological diversity. Um, could you tell us two things, maybe, and this will really conclude uh, our, our session. How does the current COVID-19 pandemics influence the global diversity agenda from, from from your viewpoint, 
And what should countries uh, take to tackle this challenge? We've heard uh, from, from Europe, we will, we've heard from civil society, uh, from West Asia, the Middle East, and we would love to have your view coming from China and Asia. And also, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about the priorities of your government for the next COP. Mr. Liu, the, the floor is yours. Can, can you hear me? Oh. The floor is yours. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, question. I'm very sorry. Due to connection issues, uh, I just got line on now. Got online now. One year ago, I attended uh, your forum in Paris physically. So one year has passed, and the whole international situation has actually changed, as you may know. Especially ever since the COVID outbreak uh, globally. We are not actually very prepared. That's why COP20, COP15 and other related meetings have been uh, delayed. And COVID-19 uh, asked us to rethink about the relations between nature and mankind. And Nature or biodiversity also became a buzzword, not only in the uh, biodiversity area, but also in other fields such as economy, etc., etc. Because we all realize the important loss of biodiversity and the fragility of human society in the face of natural disaster and climate change. So we have to work on a whole ecosystem approach. Then we can have a better prepared uh, society facing all kinds of pandemic and achieve 2013, uh, 2030 agenda of sustainable development. Although COP15 and other related meetings have been delayed to next year, but this actually provided more time for us to prepare uh, this meeting and the very difficult task of negotiation in the run up to COP15. COP so we will double efforts in negotiation so that we can further drive the process of biodiversity uh, going forward. I think COVID-19 has taught us a lot, including in the area of biodiversity. For example, what we should do going forward after COVID-19. First, we have to focus on multilateralism. We have to work together in solidarity. This has been very well proved during this pandemic because human health is highly related to uh, biodiversity protection and climate change approach. So we have to work together. We are a community. Only by working together and walking together, we can address traditional, conventional, and new challenges going forward in this world. Secondly, we have to uh, enhance investment by government in biodiversity. This is also a lesson we learned after COVID-19. We have to realize that every country has to uh, invest in uh, climate change and nature uh, protection. 
And we also have to do this together with a public health system and investment. How can public funds be better allocated to uh, address this insufficiency that has been exposed by COVID-19? All the countries and all the governments have to uh, think about this and work together. Third, we have to transform our uh, life and work and production methods. For Chinese, the harmony between uh, mankind and nature is extremely important. That's how we go about protecting nature and addressing all kinds of issues in human society and nature. That's why we highly uh, respect circular economy, and we are actually uh, taking action, concrete actions in uh, implementing this approach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Liu. Um, it's unfortunately the end of our panel. Um, I would like to really thank our speakers for this um, fascinating and extremely inspiring discussion. Um, perhaps uh, the words which uh, I have uh, memorized from the session, uh, one is urgency and time is of the essence. Second, actions, we need to act. Accountability, Isabella reminded us that uh, we need to, all of us, we need to be accountable. Inclusive narratives, uh, it's not just about climate, even if the climate urgency is obviously uh, very, very important as well, but it's an inclusive narrative with climate, environment, and biodiversity. And then the last word, perhaps, together. We have to, all of us, all over the world, and all the different actors, governments, businesses, investors, civil society, citizens, the public, all of us has, we have something to do to contribute uh, to a more sustainable world and a better future for ourselves and also for the next generation. So thank you so much again to, to our speakers and uh, to all of you. Unfortunately, we cannot see you, all, all of you listening, but uh, we hope you, you enjoy the discussions. Bye-bye. Thank you.